guys. Welcome back to the Left of Straight Show interviews, the premier podcast that shares the stories of our amazing LGBTQ community and, of course, fantastic straight allies, all from entertainment, foodies, books, music, and advocacy. I'm your host, as always, Scott Fullerton, and let's start talking. Welcome back, friends. Today, I'm honored to welcome the incredibly talented John Garrison to our podcast. John's a distinguished author and historian whose scholarly works have captivated readers around the world. He's written extensively on topics ranging from Shakespeare's sonnets to cultural memory. His latest book, Red Hot Plus Boo, delves into the world of Cole Porter's music, examining the groundbreaking tribute album that not only celebrated Porter's genius, but also supported the fight against HIV AIDS. John's deep exploration of music, history, and cultural impact would undoubtedly make for a fascinating conversation, and I can't wait to dive into this iconic moment in music history. But first, let's take a look. The more cases of HIV infection we can prevent now, the less cases of AIDS will be seen in the future. Alrighty, guys, we are back. That is Every Time We Say Goodbye by the wonderful Annie Lennox, featured on Red, White, Plus Blue. John Garrison's in studio. Welcome, John. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much. You brought back a lot of memories for me for this book. I got a little copy here, and I appreciate it immensely. Uh, let's start off with a little history about you first, John, since this is your first time on the show. Let me know a little bit about you. Where did you grow up, and what kind of a kid were you? Well, gosh, <laughs> it's funny. I, I really think of what kind of kid I was. But um, I grew up in Northern California, and I grew up in kind of a suburb of San Francisco, um, came of age in high school in the late eighties and then went to college in the early nineties. And, um, that was a really kind of important moment for me also in terms of the album, because where I grew up in the, you know, I was 30 minutes from San Francisco, but, um, AIDS was barely ever mentioned. Gay people were rarely ever mentioned. Right. Um, so when I, um, left home and went to college at, Berkeley and then later moved to San Francisco, it was just amazing to me. There was this whole other world, um, literally just a short drive away. So, yeah, I was, was um, around 84, 85. I was born in Southern California. Around 84, 85, okay. I moved up to Monterey, so uh, California. So I was about an hour and a half on the Southern side there. And yeah, that was a whole different experience going up there. But yeah, it was, it was totally. exciting and scary at that time, at, yeah. during those years, for sure. And you're a very proud out gay man. Talk about that experience. When did you start coming out to yourself? And where do you feel you started to find that LGBTQ2 tribe? Uh, I can't, you know, I, I was really lucky in the sense that in high school, and this is like, I don't know, like mid to late 80s, there were a few out gay people, even in my kind of suburban, I don't know, bedroom community kind of place. Um, so I was able to connect with them and through them, able to connect to a community. And we'd, we'd go to San Francisco, I don't know, on Sundays, we go to the I-Beam to the tea dance, I guess. Um, not sure how we got in at that young age, but <laughs> we'll talk about that. But it was really, I mean, it was, it was really fantastic for me to like get to know a gay community, but all the while be aware of the fact that, um, I mean, AIDS was something on everyone's mind, as you recall, there there was no cure. There was no cocktail. There were no effective treatments. So it was also a super scary time to come out. But I was lucky because my parents were super accepting. My mom um, ended up leading the PFLAG group, the Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Um, in my 
suburb, I guess. My dad was super accepting. My story in a lot of ways was very different than other people's stories in that period. Right, around that time, for sure. That is amazing. And talk about how you became interested in cultural history. I was looking over some of your work, some amazing stuff there. What what kind of brought all of that together for you in the forefront? Was that something you studied in school or just a passion at the time? Um, you know, it's funny. It, it all kind of came wide open for me in college in a course on Shakespeare. Shakespeare has all these very sort of, I don't know, what get dismissed is close, close, close friends. And I thought to myself, I don't know, they're like holding hands, like male friends, they're holding hands, they're like, saying they love each other, they're kind of on a bed together talking. Like, all of a sudden, I became aware of two things. One was that there's a whole bunch of gay history before us that no one talks about that people dismiss all the time. But also that it was really complex because in Shakespeare's time, and I mean, until kind of recently, like no one knew about like gay people, homosexuals as a singular category. So I just became super fascinated about like, who were we a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago? What did I have in common with people in the past? that I, mean, I felt like unlocking that answer was going to help me unlock kind of who I was and who I am right now. Who was the first subject? Was Shakespeare the first subject you kind of started studying on that and then it kind of led to others? Or what was one of your first kind of deep dives into a subject? It's a good question. I think it started with Shakespeare, um, both because I think there, there's so much rich stuff in Shakespeare. Like you go and see a play and you're like, oh my God, you have all these different kinds of feels and stuff. Um, but Shakespeare was also kind of an intellectual mountain I wanted to climb. Um, Cole Porter, uh, several times throughout Cole Porter's career, they asked him to um, make musicals of, of Shakespeare's work. And he always said, oh, I'll never touch Shakespeare because it's like, it's, it's beyond me. Like Shakespeare is too much of a master of words for me to ever tackle. And it wasn't, it wasn't really until late in Porter's career that he made Kiss Me Kate, um, the musical of Taming the Shrew. Like he really had to come into his own to wrestle with Shakespeare. And I think for me, it was the same thing. I really felt like, okay, can I do this? Right. I've talked to so many great actors too that have that have done the same thing and kind of have to work their way through Shakespeare. And then it comes totally. much later in life when they actually feel like they've really got it and all of a sudden a little spark happens. So yeah, it takes it's it's a lot of comprehension involved there. Yeah. 100%. And you've written Yeah, you've written several books on memory and literature too. What inspired that recurring theme? I love that theme actually. Me too. It's super fascinating for me, this sort of question of memory. Um, part of it was just sort of learning about a little bit of the science of memory. So for example, um, I don't remember where I learned it, but I learned at one point that every time we remember something, we're not recalling the original experience, but neuroscientifically, we're just recalling the last time we remembered the experience. So mm. like, if you remember something and there's sad music playing or like it flashes for you, like after a traumatic event or a happy event or whatever, then all of a sudden you're attaching to that memory, the emotions of the time you're remembering it. So I guess I became kind of really fascinated by the way that memory is, um, it's, it's a fiction. It's a fiction. We're constantly telling ourselves about who we are, what our story is. And I don't know, I like, like a lot of gay people, I think. I've, I've been sort of deeply invested in this question of like, where did I come from? What have I been through? What are other people going through? How can I communicate to straight people, for example, like what it's like to have been a young gay person in the eighties. And a lot of that comes down to, you know, how I remember it, which may or may not be the facts, but it's, it's I remember how I felt when I was a right. teenager, when I was in my early twenties. Oh, that's so well said. I love that. And let's talk about talk about your musical roots first, because I read somewhere we were very similar. We're from around the same time, and Bronsky Beat was huge. That was the first kind of my awakening for it, and I saw that you kind of uh, had a little relationship with that as well. Talk about your musical awakenings back then. Yeah, you know, it's funny. So I, I said a minute ago, when we were in high school, we used to sneak into um, like gay clubs in San Francisco. And there was one particular tea dance or Sunday dance we went to, and it was all um, 
I guess it was either disco, which itself is sort of part of like our queer historical soundtrack, I guess, like Donna Summer and all that. That's sort of music of joy. And yeah, it was a lot of that, as you're saying, like Communards, Bronsky Beat, Jimmy Somerville, The Smiths, The Cure, Yaz, Erasure, like all this sort of early queer techno music, um, some of which really spoke directly to our experiences, like the, the song Small Town Boy, the Jimmy Somerville song. Like, right. it's just like, I mean, it's like a queer anthem. And even though, you know, in that song, he's like kicked out of the house and leaves everything he owns in a little black case or whatever. Like, that wasn't my story. Like, I was never kicked out of the house or getting on a train or something. But they're saying about hearing someone sing about the young queer experience that for me just like went straight to the heart. I was like, oh my God, someone's actually talking about the kinds of lives we lead. And that was just, I don't know, that was just so powerful because as you recall, like no one was talking about it No. when we were kids. So to get even, there was no internet. So to get even just like the littlest bit in a song lyric was like, oh my God, like someone else felt what I felt. It was the most amazing, it was heartbreaking, but also the most sort of empowering experience. Well, right. And that's exactly right. Because it was such a scary time because I was just coming out of the time that AIDS was really starting to come together. And so you're, you're, and you feel a little isolated to begin with because you don't have that many. I didn't have that many gay friends in school. I didn't know anyone from my school. And so you're, you kind of have that excitement of going out to your first club, but also the scariness that's surrounding this thing that no one's really talking about or knows too much about yet. So it's, it was a very yeah. hard time. A thousand percent. And when you think, I mean, especially for our generation, but really for any generation, I guess. I mean, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, like all you want is to fall in love, to have like that first kiss, um, you know, for many people to like have sexual experiences or romantic experiences. And it was this very time where you're being told, okay, sex can kill you. And like kissing, we don't, we think it's safe, but it might also be dangerous. Kissing might kill you. Right. So, it was that hard time wrestling with just that basic human urge to be loved and to touch and to connect with someone and this basic human urge to like avoid, I don't know, some deadly virus. There were, there were so many complicated mixed messages, especially for someone who was a teenager, I think, or a young person, but really for everybody, there were some, it was oh. so, it was so hard. I am tiptoeing through so many memories today. After I speak with you in a couple hours, I'm going to talk to Frank DeCaro all about his book, Disco. So I'm going to be oh going through all the eras today, getting all the feels. Awesome. I so, love yeah, it. Boy. It's yeah. going to be, I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to feel at the end of the day. It's going to be very nostalgic and very fun, but I'm excited to talk about this. How did um, Red Hot Plus Blue kind of, what did, did, were you familiar with Cole Porter beforehand or how did you kind of receive this album back in the day? You know, I'm sad to say I wasn't familiar with Cole Porter when the album came out, or at least I didn't think I was. I think, I mean, like all of us, I don't know. I mean, like I meet so many young people who have never heard of Cole Porter and then you play for them, you know, anything goes or something. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that song. And then you tell them, oh yeah, well, you know, Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett just did an album of all Cole Porter songs. And they're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like I've heard all this song. <laughs> so I'll, like you sort of realize that Cole Porter's kind of part of our embedded memory or whatever and we don't realize it um but for me my mom as i said was a leader in p-flag and she really wanted to go and see the gay men's chorus like she was just she would love choral music she herself had been in a chorus so she got tickets one night and took me and my roommate to go and see the gay men's chorus in san francisco in 1995 five years after the album came out and it was an entire evening of cole porter songs mm. And it was, it was songs by Cole Porter they were singing, but there were also Harvey Fierstein was the MC and he was reading letters and different kinds of recollections by Cole Porter of his life when he was at Yale and he was living in New York, when he was living in Paris. And all of a sudden I was just like, I don't know, it sounds silly now, but like in my early twenties, I was just like, oh my God, like there's this whole history to being gay and a whole, like we're gay people are totally embedded in the American songbook and like the tapestry of like what happened and, you know, Cole Porter writing, he wrote night and day for his lover who went away to world war II. Like there's these, the song, all these songs and histories are just show how gay people are a part of every major event in the I mean, 20th century and before and after. 
So I kind of became aware of Cole Porter that night with my mom seeing the Gay Men's Chorus and then sort of realized that, oh, there have been these um, remakes, I guess, of the songs on this AIDS album. And it all kind of began to click for me. Cole Porter, AIDS, modern music, gay identity. So when the opportunity came to write this book, Red Hot and Blue, um, this past year, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the time for me to really put together all the stuff I've been thinking about really since my early 20s. That had to be, kind of be a historian's dream when you start learning things about like one, two, three club and married yeah. to a woman, but still seeing men. And the history part of Cole Porter had to be kind of fascinating, just the personal life before the music, right? Yeah, super fascinating. Yeah, throughout Red Hot and Blue, I give little snippets of um, letters that Cole Porter wrote or telegrams he would send his lovers or little facts about his history. And you're exactly right. His, Cole Porter's history is our history. It's gay history. Um, as you just mentioned, he himself started a gay club in Manhattan called the One Two Three Club. And, um, you know, we think of gay bars and gay clubs as being something kind of about the kind of 60s, 70s, 80s, these sort of secret places for a while that we'd all go and meet, I guess, or like discover who else was gay. Um, but it turns out Cole Porter was doing it in the 30s. He was really a pioneer in terms of creating these opportunities for queer people to get together, to recognize each other, to talk about our lives. Um, he's, he's, I mean, he's like one of the great musicians or composers of our time, but he's so much more of a pioneer than we realize, I think. Oh, very much so. And uh, 33 and a third has been putting out some amazing works on different, different albums and things like that. Did they approach you? Did you have this idea and approach them? How did this uh, whole project come about? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I don't, um, I'm not even sure what, here, here's the book. I'm not sure what, what number it is, but yeah, they have, they have a whole series of books that are all about a single album. Um, and I've for a long time known about them. I just think it's so cool to write a single book on a single album and they're all told differently. Sometimes they're like the musical history of the album and it's innovation. Sometimes it's the personal history of the author. Um, but they do open calls about once a year where folks can submit ideas and proposals to write a book on a single album. Um, and I don't know, they receive hundreds, you know what I mean? And they pick like seven or something. And I just, I did a deep think about like, what are all the albums that were meaningful to me? And, you know, I went back to that whole list I did a second ago, but it's like, you know, the Smiths, the Communards, um, Fleetwood Mac, I don't even know. Uh, like the story of our lives is the story of the albums we owned. You know what I mean? Right. And I just sort of landed on Red Hot and Blue because I thought, well, all my life I've been interested not just in music, but I've been interested in kind of what our history is as queer people. And I thought, you know, a Cole Porter is just such an interesting figure in terms of thinking about, like, who were we pre-Stonewall? You know, who were we in relationship to the American standard? It, I thought, oh, well... I haven't thought a lot about that, about whole, that period and about music and stuff like that. So I thought this would be an opportunity for me to figure out some stuff about myself. That's amazing. And while you're doing the researching, were there any moments or stories that kind of stood out to you as especially moving or surprising even? Um, yeah. I mean, in fact, that happened two ways. One is that just telling people I was writing a book on Red Hot and Blue, um, People who of kind of an older generation, I guess, straight people and gay people were like, oh, my God, I remember that album. I remember that video. Um, I had that album. I had the cassette. I had this. I had the CD. So a lot of people told their stories of just loving the album. Um, but, yeah, I learned a lot about um, both the stories behind Cole Porter's songs, a lot of which this is all in the book in Red Hot and Blue, a lot of which were songs he wrote for his lovers when he was missing them or um, falling in love with them. But I also learned that this album was really the start of a lot of artists um, entrance into the fight against HIV and AIDS. So um, Annie Lennox uh, was friends with Derek Jarman, who was a filmmaker who um, died of AIDS shortly after the album came out, uh, but really wasn't involved in the HIV epidemic. Um, Bono and U2 would go on to become major figures in the fight against AIDS. Right. But um, at, at the moment of the album, they were just, they were just coming into an awareness of the pandemic. So the album's a lot of things, but the album, as you'll see, as you know, from the book, 
is the start of just a lot of musical artists saying, hey, this is something I want to really be on the forefront for. I want to really be a spokesperson about this. Yeah, it was really um, because, as you said, it just wasn't talked about at the time. So this was one of those first kind of big touchstone moments. And it kind of had to be fun, I think, to balance the historical aspects of the project, but get these personal stories of the artists involved, because there was very much personal stories with the artists. And were you able to deep dive into that at all? Was there anyone you were particularly fascinated by? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I I, I just... um... Like I, said, I I had just seen uh, for the first time "Stop Making Sense," mm. that Talking Heads concert video directed by Jonathan Demme, and I was utterly wrapped by it. I was like, "Oh my god!" Like like I knew the Talking Heads were great, but really seeing that film, I was like, "Okay, David Byrne is an absolute artistic genius," and I knew that he was on the album, and I, I don't know why, but I just sort of assumed, "Oh, like maybe he threw in a song or whatever," and. One thing I learned was that he was actually one of the kind of co-initiators of Red Hot and Blue. His sister-in-law was HIV positive. So the epidemic was very close to home for him. Um, she would die shortly after the album came out. And it was really him and John Carlin, um, who was one of the producers, and Lee Blake, who was also one of the producers, coming together because they knew people who had HIV. Uh, John Carlin was the producer, was friends with David Warner Robix, um, was friends with other artists, Keith Haring, who um, who were diagnosed with HIV and were sort of, um, very sick at the time. So it was really a passion project, this album. Absolutely love all that. And I mean, they had a benefit around the time. It was very controversial at the time, but let's talk about how did the music industry respond to the album at the time, both as kind of like an artistic project and this charitable cause. Was the music industry overly supportive or did you find much of that information out while you were researching the book? You know, I think what's so groundbreaking about it is that the music industry, because of the album, realized how much they could do. Because before the album, there had just been little kind of, I don't know, flashes of involvement. Um, Madonna and the Like a Prayer album had an insert with information about HIV. Um, TLC had that song, Let's Talk About Sex. And they would pin condoms on their clothes to raise awareness. Right. Um, there had been the Gladys Knight, Dionne Warwick, Stevie Wonder, Elton John. That's what Friends Are For. Sort of a remake of a Burt Baccarat song as a fundraiser, but it, there had never been a major undertaking. Um, so I think what this album was, and as you mentioned, there was a television special that went along with it. It was, it was really a way to model, like we can do major, major events. We can do major artistic projects. I think it really sort of blew, blew the lid off this idea that, oh, those who care about it can do kind of a minor thing around their costuming or their album. It really said we can do a lot more than that. And I think that right. that's just so impressive to me. And besides just the the symbolism and everything in the songs, how do you think uh, Cole Porter's songs have had such lasting effect? What what effect do they have on you today? That they and how are they resonating for new people that discover them throughout the years? Yeah, you know it's really interesting. I think um, one one way that Cole Porter keeps coming back. Well, there there are a couple interesting things about it. One is um. One is through revivals. And a friend of mine just said to me a couple of days ago um, that there was, there was a surge of revivals around the time of the pandemic because, or of HIV, the HIV and AIDS pandemic because so many of the creators on Broadway were sick or dying of AIDS. So because of that, there just wasn't a lot of new content coming out. So like, ironically, I guess, um, there was a whole surge in revivals, including Anything Goes. So Cole Porter and other kinds of American standards had this major comeback, I guess, in the American consciousness because queer people weren't as available to produce new content. Right. So, so uh, I mean, so that, that's sort of one kind of w weird way in which Cole Porter and the American standards come back. But I think there's a really interesting thing about the American songbook, which is that um, these standards, Gershwin, Porter... Um, they're a way for new artists to signal 
that they want to become timeless artists. So mm. Ella Fitzgerald back in the day, like wasn't, um, wasn't really catching on with the sort of broader American public and their producers advised her, well, you should record American standards. You should record the American songbook. So she did these albums where she recorded, um, Porter and other people and it skyrocketed Ella Fitzgerald to the, um, national kind of awareness. And I think the same thing is true of this Gaga, Lady Gaga, Tony Bennett album, where it's all Cole Porter songs. Certainly Lady Gaga is huge, but for Lady Gaga to kind of break into, um, maybe an old, maybe an older, more traditional audience for Lady Gaga to really signal, like, I'm here to stay. I'm not just an artist in the moment. I mean, what better way than to record an album of Cole Porter standards with someone who kind of Tony Bennett, who kind of stands for that timeless American sound. Right. So well said. And it's just, it's fascinating to look at HIV AIDS today as compared to then. I mean, it was such a scary, such a taboo project back then. And it's still around today. I mean, thank goodness we have HIV, uh, we have PrEP and we have different things to do it. But um, I don't know if I thought back then at the age I am now that we'd still be kind of dealing with this. I know Alexis Arquette shocked me when uh, she died of AIDS not too, I mean, it wasn't that many years ago, maybe eight to 10 years ago. Um, how do you feel the epidemic has kind of changed over the years and uh, how this did this kind of bring that awareness that it was looking for at the time? Did you see, did you see that it really helped the awareness issue? Yeah. You know, it's so funny for, to think about this. I mean, it's not funny at all, but like it's, it's something I think about a lot. Um, on the one hand, like AIDS awareness, all of a sudden, got people talking about kind of what was risky and what sort of what people could do and maybe shouldn't do. And that brought more talk about gay identity and um, same sex relations into the discourse, I guess. And if you think about like public demonstrations by ACT UP, um, kiss-ins, for example, were a way to kind of like, like get two men or two women kissing into the public eye in a way that it's like, this is not shocking. This is reality. <sighs> but like a, the reality of AIDS today is it really sort of points to our privilege. We think today you can be on prep. So like not worry about getting, getting infected or using condoms, I guess. Um, or people who are diagnosed with HIV can sort of be on a really kind of specialized cocktail so they live a normal life. That's fantastic. Um, but that's really true for us in a country and in other countries where people have access to healthcare and have access to these drugs. We have to remind ourselves that a not everyone in this country has access to a really good healthcare, um, but also in the developing world, like folks don't have access to um, these amazing cocktails, these amazing treatments. They aren't as regularly tested to sort of screen for different kinds of issues. There's more shame around talking about sexuality. So to say that AIDS epidemic is over or something, or AIDS is a thing of the past, like it's a way also to announce that we have a kind of privilege in the U S I think, um, or at least especially those who are insured in the U S to be able to say that. That's an amazing perspective. Yeah. It's a great way to look at that. I love that. We got to start wrapping up. Tell me about what did this project bring to you by the time you finish? What kind of enlightenments did it bring to you? And what do you hope your list, your readers kind of take away from it at the end of the day? You know, for me, I think we said at the beginning of the podcast that I sort of got my start and I've written a lot of books writing about Shakespeare um, and kind of the Renaissance. So what it brought for me is an awareness of a much more close queer history. I, I've done a lot of thinking in my career about like the queer history that we have 400 years ago or even 2000 years ago um, with the ancient Greeks and Romans. So for me, it was a lot of fun just to think about like, okay, what were queer people doing in the 19 teens, twenties, thirties, like who were we then? And that just really kind of allowed me to think about the generation that came, I guess, before us or two before us. And, you know, I think a lot of people I've talked to have read the book for a lot of people, it brings back memories, but for younger people, they say, you know what, because I didn't live through it, I've never just really had a sense of what it felt like. And they said to me, reading red, hot and blue, I now have a feeling, not just of the sort of numbers of HIV or something, 
but what it must have felt like to live during that period. And I'm really happy that I could deliver a book that allows young queer people to think about like what what is the history they're inheriting that they didn't live through, but still is really informing kind of who they are. Mm, well said. Now that you've uh, taken on this project, is there anything that any other music or genre of television or movie or anything that you might be interested to take on anymore? Is this kind of open your horizons to what you feel like writing about or how, how does it work into your body of work? I mean, you've done a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of historical, a lot of memory. How does this work into your future bodies of work? It's a great question. I don't know, but I can tell you that, um, like having listened now to a lot of Cole Porter and thought a lot about Cole Porter, I'm watching a lot more Turner classic movies and a lot less kind of <laughs> HBO showtime, I guess, like those stations are great, but, right. um, I've just become more and more curious about this kind of, I don't know, early period and maybe sort of who the queer people were, who were navigating those spaces. I'm, I'm just more aware that. I don't know, it was such a rich time for the U.S., this kind of time between the wars. I'm curious who we were back then. I love that. And now, I mean, we're we're doing this in so-called spooky season, gay Christmas and everything. And so we think about all the queer coding and horror movies and things like that. Totally. There's been queer coding all throughout different uh, aspects of, of life, right? So I think you really start to think about these other genres that have this interesting history. So you would be 100%. the person to tackle it, my friend. <laughs> okay, well, keep an eye out. There you go. Well, I appreciate it, John Garrison. Thank you so much for sharing your story on the Left of Straight Show interviews. Remind everyone where they can find the book and uh, if they want to follow along and check out some of your other work as well. It's a great question. Red, Hot, and Blue. It's sold at any um, independent bookstore or major bookstore near you or online, the usual places. Um, I have a website. It's www.john slash garrison dash garrison dot com uh folks can check out my other books and interviews and things like that but um yeah i think i'd love for folks to read the book i poured my heart into it there you go read the book get the album see if you can stream the songs on it amazing songs yeah. as well john stay on the line for me guys we got a special five questions with john next week so be sure to look for that we appreciate you tuning in every time to the left of straight show interviews have a great week everyone Bye bye Thanks for listening to The Left of Straight Show. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distributor and please give us a five-star rating so more listeners can find us. You can follow us on social media and be sure to check out our website for contests and other news and information. See you next week.